Hey there, this is Gaëtan from The Flares. This podcast is usually in French, but we occasionally invite English speaking guests. This is the case for this episode. Today, I have the pleasure to talk with Owen Brian Toon, professor of atmospheric and oceanic sciences. He is known to be one of the first to discover and simulate the long effects of a nuclear war called nuclear winter. This is what we are going to discuss in this episode. This conversation is available on YouTube with French subtitles or in audio only on Spotify and other platforms to listen to podcasts. You can like, comment and subscribe to support this podcast. Thank you and let's go. Bienvenue sur le podcast de Thank you, Brian, for accepting my invitation. Uh, but first, could you introduce yourself, your work and background? Okay, um, I'm a professor at the University of Colorado in, in Boulder. And um, I work on lots of different things, planetary science and the climate and various other issues. I think you're most interested in the work we've been doing on uh, nuclear wars. Uh, so we've been working on this for around 30 years or 35 years. Basically started with my group because of the uh, discovery of an asteroid that had killed the dinosaurs, which happened 66 million years ago. We um, started to study why that might have happened. Someone suggested to us, well, well, what you're finding sounds a lot like what might happen in a nuclear war. So why don't you also look at that issue? So we did look at that. And sure enough, we found that what killed the dinosaurs is probably very similar to what um, might actually happen to people in a, um, after a nuclear war. How do we know a nuclear winter happened 65 million years ago? What kind of uh, evidence uh, can we find? Well, we know the dinosaurs went extinct, so something terrible happened across the Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the clues to that are uh, in this little layer of rock that you can find places where uh, rocks of that age are exposed. And it, there, there are a lot of soot there along with debris from the asteroid. And um, if you put all that smoke back into the atmosphere, Um, in a model, of course, uh, it gets incredibly uh, dark at the surface. In fact, sunlight levels fall about to one millionth of the current typical amount of sunlight that is around. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it stays below 1% for a couple of years. And this matters because uh, plankton in the oceans and other creatures on the land need more than 1% of sunlight to photosynthesize. Uh, and so in the oceans, you got a mass extinction from that. Um, the sunlight levels fell so low that the plankton couldn't reproduce anymore. And they all got gobbled up by the fish and the zooplankton and the whole food chain collapsed. And so we're pretty sure that's what happened in the oceans. Um, on the land, it's, um, there's a lot of food to eat. Um, so it would be harder to destroy food quickly like that it happens in the oceans. Um, but on the, on the land, the um, large creatures, uh, all the large dinosaurs died, whereas uh, little creatures, were part, which were our ancestors, were like mice and rodents, um, survived. And uh, which is probably because the little ones had a way to shelter. Um, and so everything burned on the surface of the planet to make all this soot. Uh, and of course, a large creature is going to um, have trouble escaping those fires. And the way the fires were set is that the debris from the um, asteroid re-entered the atmosphere probably over the whole globe as shooting stars, countless numbers of shooting stars. So probably everybody has seen a shooting star as a little trail of light across the sky, which is because a little sand-sized grain of dust has moved at very high speeds through the air and the friction with the air has heated it up and vaporized it. And you know that would happen, that's what happened also here in the extinction of the dinosaur case. <clears throat> and so the shooting stars don't come down and hit you on the head. They stop at about 40 kilometers above the surface. And there are not a few of them like normal shooting star storm. You might see a shooting star every minute or something like that. But in this case, there are 10,000 shooting stars on the ground for every square centimeter of ground, 10,000. You know, so the whole sky was full of shooting stars. You know, and if you were a dinosaur standing on the ground, you know, and you looked up all of a sudden, the sky probably looked like, a, like you were standing in front of a sheet of lava or something. You know, it was red, hot, uh, glowing, burning light. Um, and, you know, it's 
you can reproduce this if you want to. And uh, if you go open your oven and you turn it on broil, um, the glow bar in your oven on broil is a red glowing thing that's just the same energy uh, intensity the dinosaurs saw. And, you know, so you can go get a dinosaur if you want, go to the store, get a chicken or a turkey. They're dinosaurs uh, that survived. So the avian dinosaurs survived. It put it in there on broil. And uh, pretty soon it'll be all charred and blackened. You know, people cook turkeys and chickens all the time, but they do it on bake, you know, where there's not quite so much energy there. And so anyway, that's what happened to the dinosaurs is that uh, they probably broiled alive in that um, in that uh, environment of glowing skies, which lasted only a few hours probably. And our ancestors were living in little holes in the ground, and so they just went down their holes and hid out until the fires went away. And uh, then it was pitch black for a couple of years, but there was still enough light. It would sort of be like a moonless night, uh, what it looked like. And so they could still uh, wander around and uh, find water, or, and there were things underground to eat, like uh, roots and grubs and worms and things like that. Whereas, you know, the dinosaurs, if any survived, the uh, fires would have been wandering around in the dark and have trouble finding enough to eat, and most of it would have been burned. Um, so that's we think happened to the dinosaurs. Um, you know, in the nuclear war, you have much of the same thing. You have all these weapons that are exploding in cities. So right now, the U.S. and Russia, um, between them, have about four thousand nuclear weapons that are called strategic weapons. Uh, a large fraction of which are on alert, ready to be launched at a moment's notice. Um, there are only 500 cities in Russia and the United States altogether. There's about 200 in Russia and 300 in the United States with more than 100,000 people in them. So there's 500 cities, 4,000 weapons. <laughs> there's 8,000 nuclear weapons who attack every city in Russia and the United States with more than 100,000 people in them. You know, you, you don't, we know from Hiroshima that one little weapon is enough to destroy most of a city. And these are, these weapons are mostly 30 times more powerful than the one that fell on Hiroshima. It, it, it very seems to be an overkill to have so many weapons for not, not that many targets. So, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's what not I'm... just in the United States because there are a lot of targets in Europe as well. Mm. And so there is, a, I found about 600 targets in Europe, what I think would be military targets. You know, they're things like military bases, but there are also things like, um, well, in France, it would be either nuclear weapons storage places and places where nuclear capable aircraft would be or submarines would be. But there are also things like airports, uh, oil depots, oil refineries, probably some universities and places like government laboratories would be destroyed, weather prediction places would be destroyed. So there's targets there which are probably being targeted by a different type of weapon. So Russia has around 2,000 tactical weapons. Um, the only difference between a strategic weapon and a tactical weapon is how you deliver it. Um, you know, so the strategic ones are on ICBMs or submarine missiles, and the tactical ones are on bombers or cruise missiles or small motor aircraft. And, you know, Russia has thousands of these things uh, to use um, in a war against Europe. Um, so there's a lot of scary weapons out there. And, um, you know, it's it's not just, of course, uh, only those countries would be attacked. Uh, they're probably Japan and South Korea would be attacked by Russia because of American military bases there. Um, Australia has um, some... Uh, Long-range communication systems are talking to submarines and probably be attacked with nuclear weapons by the Russians. Not that many targets in the, the southern hemisphere, but there are a few. So to go back to asteroids, how big it has to be to trigger a nuclear winter, uh, according to your research? Well, the one that uh, killed the dinosaurs uh, by hitting what's now the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico was about 10 kilometers in diameter. And it had an energy which was about um, equal to 100 million large nuclear weapons. Um, and so if you take the entire nuclear arsenals on the Earth now, 
the asteroid had about 100,000 times as energy of all the nuclear weapons on the planet now. So that was a much bigger energy release. And the amount of everything on the planet burned. So we think it would produce about 100 times as much smoke as we produced in a nuclear war. Um, so it's you know a much more severe situation. Um, in a nuclear war, we think the uh, smoke would reduce sunlight to about 20% of normal levels. Um, for a couple of years. So it wouldn't be enough to stop photosynthesis in the oceans, but it would be enough to make temperatures at mid-latitudes uh, be below zero, be below freezing um, for quite a long time. So we looked at places like the Ukraine and um, Iowa, which are both bread baskets of you know, the surrounding areas. And in both cases in these um, in a nuclear conflict between the United States and NATO with Russia and its allies. Uh, in both the Ukraine and Iowa, the temperatures dropped below freezing very quickly after the war in the Burning Seas, and they stay below freezing um, for several years. In other words, there's no day in which the temperature doesn't go below freezing uh, during the night or the lowest time of the coldest time of the day for a couple of years. You're not going to grow anything. Um, in those places for several years. So we've tried to analyze agriculturally what would happen from this. And so we've, we've, we wrote a recent paper in Nature Food, which is a part of the British magazine series of nature magazines. And um, we've analyzed for each country in the world um, how many people would survive after the second year. And um, so the second year, things haven't even gotten to their worst. Temperatures are still falling in the second year, and it takes about a decade for things to recover. But in the second year, we found that if we assume that there's no trade, people stop trading because they can't grow enough crops to feed their population. And we made the extreme assumption that only a small fraction of people would get the minimum amount of food to survive. Everybody else would get no food. That's not going to happen because the people who don't get any food are going to kill the people who are getting food. But nevertheless, we find in Russia that about 2% of the population would still be alive at the end of the second year. In the United States, there'd be about 3% left. In uh, Canada, it'd be 2%. China would be about 3%. Uh, Northern Europe uh, would be similarly a couple percent. So um, most of the, the Northern Hemisphere has a severe population loss just from starvation. There's no, no food to eat. There's a few places that um, are not so bad, um, like um, in the Southern Hemisphere, Argentina uh, ends up with a large fraction of its population left. New Zealand and um, Australia have most of their population left. Uh, parts of Southern Africa have tens of percent of their population left. Um, as a total, we find uh, that about so the current population of the Earth is about 8 billion people, and we think about 6 billion people would have died, and there'd be a couple billion people left, mostly in the Southern Hemisphere. Well, yeah, this is a, such a yeah. disaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what's the process used to assess the effect of nuclear winter? Do you use a computer simulation, and um, like, um, what's the yeah the model? How do you create them? Okay, well, there's a whole series of problems in here you have to solve. And some of them we know things about because of uh, natural phenomena. And some of them we don't. We have to use climate models. So, you know, the, uh, the weapons go off and they start fires. And we know a lot about that because Hiroshima had a fire and there were 500 above ground nuclear weapons tests. And so we know where you expect to create a fire. Now, the military ignores fires. Um, they don't want to think about fires because they're complicated and um, you have to have fuel to make a fire, which is in the weapons tests that were conducted, they all did them in deserts so they wouldn't have fires. But the fires are the most devastating thing that happens. And um, we don't know that much about fires in cities. We know more about fires in forests because most cities, if you start a little fire somewhere, the fire department puts it out. But after a nuclear war, the fire department's not going to put out any fires. They'll be overwhelmed by a whole burning city. 
anyway, so the fires would start and burn the fuel that's there. Th this would cause rising motion and um, a huge cloud to form, which would carry this stuff into the upper atmosphere. And we've seen that happen in 2017 and 2020 with fires in British Columbia and Australia that were intense enough to carry this smoke aloft. Uh, and once it gets into the stratosphere, it rises to really high altitudes, which we also saw happen in 2020 and 2017. Uh, after that, um, we don't have observations of you know, burning cities. Um, and so we have to then use climate models. Now, we do have some similar things that have happened um, from volcanic eruptions. So there have been some big volcanic eruptions like um, in 1815, the Mount Tambora in Indonesia exploded. And it caused what was called the year without a summer, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. And um, for example, in New England and the United States, crop, there were crop failures. Um, so there was a late snowstorm in June that killed the crops and the people replanted. And there were frosts that happened in July and August. And then there was an early fall. You know, so it basically um, destroyed agriculture in New England. And it was likewise very bad weather in Europe it was right after the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, there was a potato famine in um, Ireland, and uh, it was bad weather in Germany. And so there was a, there were a lot of food problems there also. So we know something about this from volcanoes, which we can use our climate models to represent. Um, <clears throat> but volcanoes are different because uh, volcanoes basically put sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, which it looks like water, it's transparent. And the smoke is not transparent, it's black and sort of absorbs the sunlight. So that's more like a day-night thing. You know, and climate models are good at making day and night, and they know how to make winter and summer. Um, so this is not something that climate models have never done. They, they do day, day and night all the time. Um, and so the climate models are then predict how cold it gets at the surface in different places and how much um, rainfall is um, reduced. There is a huge reduction in rainfall because it gets cold, won't have as much evaporation. And, uh, you know, so low light levels and uh, low light and low amount of rainfall that affects crops, but mostly the crops are just affected by the temperature drop. You know, the, the temperature drops to ice age conditions in the northern hemisphere. Um, it's, the temperature decline is 10 degrees centigrade or so on a global average, which is a pretty big temperature drop. Um, and uh, so it's not a subtle effect. There are some things there we don't know about. Um, so there's a huge loss of ozone. So the ozone layer is mostly destroyed. What happens then is that a lot of ultraviolet light gets down to the surface, which we're not used to. You know, people could deal with this. You know, it's like getting a sunburn. Instead of going to the beach, you put on suntan lotion and protect yourself. Or you stay inside. You do the same thing. Probably um, you couldn't go outside. Um, for more than tens of minutes or something like that after a nuclear war like this um, without getting um, a bad sunburn. Um, but, you know, trees and animals don't have suntan lotion. And we don't know what they would do in this harsh environment with a lot of ultraviolet light. And so that's something that we don't know how to evaluate because people are, and the biota are not um, used to that circumstance. We don't have any data to how would they're going to happen? It'd be like a global ozone hole. Um, so it'd be right. uh, not just over Antarctica, where there isn't anything that can be affected by the ultraviolet light. It would be a global ozone hole. And, and have you also studied the the how long the the planet will be radioactive and like the the fallout? Does it last a long time in in the environment after a nuclear exchange? Sure. So this is a complicated problem about radioactive fallout. After the above ground nuclear weapons test, which ended in about 1963 because of a treaty, now that there were little more than 500 nuclear weapons that were exploded. And uh, they were distributing long-lived isotopes, particularly strontium-90, around the Earth. And this was starting to accumulate in uh, children's bones and teeth. You know, people actually found enhanced radioactivity in children's teeth, which is why they banned the uh, exploding nuclear weapons in the atmosphere any further. The amount of weapons exploded before 1963 
and uh, there were a lot of those were big, powerful weapons. Um, it's not too much different from what would happen if you used all the strategic weapons now. There'd be maybe two or three times as much radiation release. And so that long-lived radiation release, you know, wouldn't be good, but it probably wouldn't be fatal. It would just um, make subtle changes in people's health. Um, so a lot of people think, oh, there'd be this um, worldwide radiation that would kill everybody. From the, just an uh, idea left over from a movie called On the Beach, um, where everybody's dead except one group of people that were in a submarine and didn't get exposed. But, you know, that's not not a realistic thing to happen. There are, there are two other kinds of things that are a problem. One of them is that if you live in a place like I do, so I live in Colorado, and um, about 50 miles north of me, there's um, 50 nuclear weapons sitting in the ground. And if Russia wanted to attack those, it would use what are called ground bursts. It would blow up a weapon right at the surface, maybe even just below the surface, because it's trying to dig a big crater in the ground to destroy those missiles. And when you have a ground burst, what happens is a bomb goes off and there's all this dirt blown into the air from the ground and the radiation atta attaches itself to the dirt and the, the dirt's heavy and so it falls out pretty fast. Um, and so if, if you happen to live downwind of a place where there were ground bursts, you know, the wind would blow the dust downwind and it would fall on you. Um, and you could get a serious um, radiation exposure from that. Uh, and so people have um, observed that to happen in the nuclear weapons test. There was one that was done in the Pacific Ocean. And that was a 50, I guess I've forgotten the yield of the weapon, but it was much bigger than they expected it to be. And it put a bunch of fallout down on a bunch of Pacific Islanders there, you know, it killed at least one one person who was on a fishing vessel, and it made a whole bunch of the Pacific Islanders sick, and there's still a lot of their children who have thyroid cancer and have had to have their thyroids removed because they absorbed a lot of radioactivity <clears throat> from that bomb blast. So that would be a big problem in the, in the footprints from that, you know, where they blow down wind from where the bomb hit. And, um, you know, they can go hundreds of miles downwind with a lethal dose. Um, and, you know, so that can be depending on how many missiles are attacked there, which could be hundreds. Um, you could have, a, you know, downwind from the United, you know, Western United States, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, those states. You could have hundreds of miles downwind where there was a lethal dose of radiation. And uh, so a lot of people call, uh, call this a sponge where they've uh, attracted the Russian weapons into the middle of the United States where there isn't much, instead of having them hit the West Coast and the East Coast. I don't really appreciate that thought since I live in the sponge and uh, make a whole lot more sense to get rid of those weapons so the Russians wouldn't be inclined to attack anything in the United States to put the weapons offshore in the oceans, which is what the British and the French have largely done is put most of their weapons on submarines instead of on their land mass. The French have, have nuclear weapons on the land, um, and um, but make more sense not to have them on the land. Um, at, at any rate, so that's another radiation um, danger. If you want to do the most damage to a city, you don't do ground burst. You blow the weapon up above the ground, like the one over at Hiroshima was blown up 600 meters above the surface, and a bigger bomb you blow up even higher <clears throat> to do the most damage from shock waves uh, from the bomb. And that radiation then blows down wind, but it's not on the surface, it's above in the air. And so the, the radiation from the bomb actually decays very, very rapidly. And so it only takes a few days before it's only 1% as radioactive as it was originally. Um, so what the message there is if you happen to be in an area that's attacked, you know, you want to stay in your house and close up all the windows so you don't have any air coming in from the outside. And, you know, as long as you weren't in the area that has an active fire, you know, then it'd be better not to run away and try to hide out from the radiation for a few days. The only other hooker in all of this is uh, nuclear reactors. You know, so there's lots of nuclear reactors in the world. There's more than 100 in the United States and a large number in France and 
So you know, most countries have nuclear reactors these days. And um, if those were attacked, then um, probably this ed fuel around the reactor and the reactor cores would all be breached. And um, there's a lot of radiation in, re in these reactors, much more than there is in the bombs. Uh, and um, even if you didn't directly attack them, they'd probably lose their power supply and um, they'd be unable to keep the cooling going in the power plant and the, you would get a meltdown like at Fukushima and um, Chernobyl and the reactors would um, rupture anyway. So that's a very dangerous source of radiation that no one has really assessed the dangers from that radiation of nuclear reactors being destroyed across the globe, but it would, that would probably be a significant problem. Yeah, yeah that, that's good to know, because I was also under the impression that the the radiation from the bomb and the explosion will be more uh, dramatic, but uh, except if it's, uh, like you said, underground, it should be, it decays pretty fast. You were also a part of a research team who published an article on the consequences of an India-Pakistan nuclear war. Can you maybe describe your findings? Yeah, so India and Pakistan each now have about 150 weapons, which is a surprisingly large arsenal. They're, they're building their arsenals up very rapidly. It's thought by um, the middle of the century that India and Pakistan will have about the same number of weapons as Britain and France and China. And so right, right now, 90% of the weapons are in Russia and the United States. But there's a thousand and 1,500, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 nuclear weapons in uh, Britain and France and China, India, Pakistan, North Korea. Um, and um, so there's a lot of weapons there. And uh, so we've looked at a, a nuclear war between India and Pakistan, in which they altogether use about 250 weapons to attack each other. <clears throat> That'd be half, about half of the arsenal they'd have uh, toward the middle or the end of this decade. The likelihood of a war there uh, has been pretty high because there this continuing conflict between the two countries over Kashmir, um, which um, is, uh, there's an Indian Kashmir and there's a Pakistani Kashmir and there's a Chinese Kashmir, uh, which people don't talk about very much, but all three of those countries are have borders there that are not well defined. And in India and Pakistan have had numerous conflicts there and have threatened to have nuclear wars several times. And, and the thing that makes it likely to have a conflict there is that Pakistan is a much smaller country than India. I mean, India is the second or the first largest in population in the world, 1.3 billion or something like that. And Pakistan has only got about 200 million people uh, in it. And uh, so the population is very imbalanced. And Pakistan is geographically much smaller than India. And India has an army that's a lot bigger than Pakistan's. And so you can imagine a scenario where some terrorist blows up the Indian parliament, which happened once in the past, which made the Indians really mad, and they moved their army to the border. Unfortunately, the U.S. stepped in and stopped them from starting a war, and other countries also tried to do the same thing. Um, but, you know, if that kind of a thing happened again, you can imagine India saying, oh, we've had enough of this. We're just going to go and invade Pakistan and get rid of them. Uh, and the Pakistanis, you know, could be easily overrun by the Indians because they're so small. And so they would probably think, well, we have to use our nuclear weapons quickly or we'll lose them. So then they might use their nuclear weapons. Um, so anyway, what we found was that the weapons themselves might kill 50 to 125 million people. Um, in a U.S.-Russia NATO war, we think about 300 million people just killed by bomb blasts and fires. And India, Pakistan, 50 to 125 million people would die from the explosions. But the amount of smoke from these burning cities, there's so much material in these cities in India and Pakistan because they're so densely populated. And we think that that would produce a huge amount of smoke also. And it wouldn't make ice age kind of conditions, but it would cool the planet by several degrees. So the amount of cooling would depend on how big these weapons are, which we don't know what the yields of the weapons are in India and Pakistan. Um, but we predict that a war between India and Pakistan 
would end up killing one to three billion people worldwide because of the smoke damaging agriculture um, worldwide. That's only a few hundred weapons. The United States and Russia and have you know thousands of weapons, you know. So to reduce the danger of having a nuclear winter, which are or nuclear damage to agriculture, we have to pull the number of weapons way down from the current numbers to prevent that from happening. It's it's, it's very scary because we would think. India and Pakistan, it's a local conflict. The, even if there is a nuclear war between those two countries and it doesn't escalate to a World War III type of situation, it will still be not a global catastrophe, but um, like three billion people starving. That's a... Uh, half the earth, half the yeah. population. Yeah, so bad. they're the effect of way beyond their own countries and their own borders and It's just like Russia and the United States get into a war, then you know, large numbers of people are going to die in the Middle East and China and all these other countries that had nothing to do with the conflict. Uh, you know, there is some hope that in the um, United Nations uh, about two years ago, the you know the Security Council, which controls the United Nations, is built up of the nuclear weapon states, which will never agree to get rid of their weapons, even though they have treaties, which they have agreed to, which says they will build them down, which they are doing. They have built their weapons. There were 70,000 nuclear weapons in the mid-1980s, and now there's only about 8,000 left or something like that. Um, so they have built them down, but they're not continuing to build them down. They've stopped. Um, but nevertheless, in the, the rest of the United Nations has got together and you know, created a treaty banning nuclear weapons. Um, you know, so nuclear weapons are now banned, like landmines and um, uh, biological weapons and poison gases. You know, those are all banned by treaties. And um, the same thing is now true of nuclear weapons. It's illegal to have nuclear weapons. It's illegal to um, help another country build nuclear weapons. It's illegal to possess them, to keep building them. Um, and so there is a treaty that should get rid of nuclear weapons if only the nuclear powers would actually pay any attention to this treaty, which they are now totally ignoring. We talk about uh, the like a local conflict between India and Pakistan would still result in a nuclear winter. So what would be the minimum number of nuclear explosions needed to trigger a nuclear winter? Do you, do you know that? Well, India and, and Pakistan wouldn't cause a nuclear winter. The definition of a nuclear winter is there are sub freezing temperatures for a year or more at mid-latitudes. And that, that wouldn't happen after war between India and Pakistan. It would, it'd be cooler, but it wouldn't it would not be sub freezing temperatures continually there. This is a question we get asked all the time. And the answer is uh, there is no clear minimum. It's not like you take one a bunch of weapons and you add one more and all of a sudden you get a nuclear winter. It's sort of a continuity of of um, bad things happening, you know, a nuclear war between the United States and Russia would cause a nuclear winter, probably kills most of the people on the planet. And a nuclear war between India and Pakistan with 200 weapons instead of 4,000 weapons, you know, you've gone from 4,000 to 200, you know, the factor of 20, and you're still killing a billion or more people on the planet. You know, eventually, of course, you know, one weapon is not going to um, do anything. We've had numerous cases of one weapon exploding in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which there were small weapons. And of course, in the middle of a war, we don't really know much about what happened there. Um, but, you know, so the answer basically is if you use 100 moderate yield weapons on cities, you know, you're in danger of producing um, severe weather, which will kill a fraction of the population of the planet. Um, 10 weapons probably couldn't do it. The numbers are very small where it's important. Yeah, and it's much smaller than the the arsenal on the planet, which is uh, almost 9,000, 10,000. So yeah, that's yeah. obviously if everything is used, uh, that's that's the end of everything. And of course you can ask, you know, I mean, the excuse people have for having nuclear weapons is it uh, is a deterrent to keep people from attacking them. You know, you can argue whether this deterrent works or not. I mean, for example, in Ukraine now, you know, Putin keeps claiming he's going to attack us with nuclear weapons. 
you know, which has not prevented Europe and the United States from helping the Ukrainians repel the Russian invasion. So it hasn't actually worked. But on the other hand, we haven't sent troops into the Ukraine to help them. So you could argue, well, it has provided some deterrent there. Um, the United States are not going to invade Russia, which probably would start a nuclear war. Um, and the, you know, the other argument about this is, well, accidents happen. We've come very close to a nuclear war in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, you know, we've come very close to a nuclear war several other times. There's the main the main issue here is about short warning times. So it takes 20 or 30 minutes from a missile to get from Russia to the United States. Um, so if our early warning systems say, oh, the Russians have launched their missiles, the American president has 20 or 30 minutes to wake up, he's in the middle of sleeping or something like that, and find out that, oh, he has to decide if he's going to end Western civilization because he thinks there's been a Russian missile launch. You know, does he believe the early warnings? You know, and that's the danger of these uh, whistle missiles that are sitting on the ground. If you don't launch them, you're going to lose them. Russian submarines, you know, probably they don't know where they are, so you don't have to launch those missiles. But the ones in the ground, are, that's a very great danger. And so both Russia and the United States have had cases where they thought the other side had launched their missiles. In one case, it certainly went up to Boris Yeltsin, and you know he was smart enough to decide not to launch his missiles and uh, to think the warning was wrong. And there have been several other cases where there were detections of missile launches that were um, ignored by people at lower levels and thought that there was probably incorrect. But that's very dangerous. And we're in a bad situation right this minute because both Russia and the United States are modernizing their arsenals, which is a violation of their treaties. And Russia in particular is trying to get to shorter and shorter warning times. Um, they have uh, tried to develop a nuclear-powered cruise missile, which would just fly around in the atmosphere constantly. And if they suddenly decided to attack you, they'd push a button and all of a sudden they'd attack you. Um, they have uh, things that certainly do exist, which are um, torpedoes, they call them, which are very large vessels that are submersible drones. And um, they're going to put very big weapons on them, and they would just sail them into the harbors around the world and potentially even blackmail people. Oh, I just... Um, they tried to do this with Britain. They said, oh, well, we're just going to put one of our torpedoes um, on the western coast of uh, Britain and blow it up and spread radiation all over Britain if you don't stop um, arming Ukraine. Uh, and you can imagine them saying, oh, well, we just put them in uh, every harbor in you know, Europe and every harbor in the United States. We're going to blow them all up if you don't do whatever we say. Um, you know, so that's very dangerous. And another very dangerous thing happening is as you make the sh warning times really short, there's going to be a temptation for the military to decide that they have to allow artificial intelligence to determine if there's been uh, a missile launch and uh, whether they should respond. So I don't know about you, but <laughs> my computer doesn't work that well. You know, millions of people use Macintosh computers, and I still can't get a Zoom meeting going all the time you know, without it failing somewhere. I, I don't want artificial intelligence deciding for me if there's going to be a nuclear war. Uh, and that's where we're headed in the near future, is uh, having artificial intelligence making this decision for us, because these weapons are so sophisticated that uh, people can't control them. They don't have the ability to control them. You can even see this with the Ukraine. The Ukrainians are being attacked by hypersonic missiles from Russia, which have such a short travel time. It's very difficult for them to detect them and shoot them down. And, you know, so they're going to have to turn to some very rapid decision-making system, which is probably an artificial intelligence thing. So they, oh, I've just taken the launch. I'm going to go attack it. You know, that's just a very dangerous path to go down. You know, and we don't know. Artificial intelligence may turn out to not be that stupid. It may decide it doesn't like us and it's going to get rid of us on purpose. It's kind of uh, like the that's the plot for a sci-fi movie we've seen before. <laughs> that's definitely exactly. a pretty bad uh, scenario. And, but I, I, I saw a bill recently was proposed to prevent uh, AI from being put in charge of launching nuclear weapons. Uh, do you know if this is... Uh, I mean, I guess it's a good... First step, 
but uh, I don't know if it's going to be approved or. Uh, even if it is uh, illegal to use artificial intelligence that way, whether they would actually obey that in countries with nuclear wars. A nuclear war will be nothing like the Second World War. And the Second World War went on for six or seven years. You know, and so there was a long period of time where people adjusted their tactics. You know, originally, the U.S. tried to bomb individual buildings to try to destroy industries. Um, you know, that never worked. We, we were never able to really hit individual buildings. And so by the end of the war, there was just indiscriminate bombing. You had 500 bombers would fly over a city, drop incendiary bombs on them, and try to burn the city, which they did to 60-something Japanese cities, as well as Hamburg and Dresden in Europe, for example. And, um, you know, that was just indiscriminate attacks on civilian population centers, which was a illegal even then as a, an act of war. And, you know, so if you get desperate, you do illegal things. And then the nuclear war is going to probably last a week or maybe only a few minutes. You know, we could destroy both countries and leave Russia nothing but a smoldering ruin and the United States and Europe nothing but a smoldering ruin within 30 minutes. Um, you know, people think, oh, well, this is an abstract thing. No, it's not. There are nuclear weapons aimed at us right now. You know, I know in the town I lived in, I know that there's probably five nuclear weapons aimed at Boulder, Colorado, because there's a weather protection facility there. There's a bunch of people that do launches of missiles for space exploration. Um, there's a bunch of um, people who do GPS satellites. And, you know, they'd all be destroyed by the Russians in a nuclear war. And it's not an abstract thing. There are missiles aimed at people right now, <clears throat> on the go, ready to be launched. Um, so, you know, we could destroy Western civilization in an hour or less. Um, and so that's that's not a hypothetical. That's a thing that could happen. It is terrifying. And do you think nuclear winter is known by the public? Um, what what role does the media play in informing the public about the potential dangers of nuclear war and nuclear winter? No, I think the public doesn't know much about it. I've, I've given a TED talk, which now has about 8 million people who've seen it which means a tenth of a percent of the population of the planet actually has hardly heard of it, I think. But, you know, it's even more concerning about how many politicians have heard of it. You know, when I was young, people knew about nuclear wars because of the Japanese experience, you know, monsters like Godzilla. And they know that's a nuclear radiation mutant. You know, and there are all kinds of movies like that when I was young and when I went to school, we did drills where you were supposed to hide under your desk in case there was a nuclear explosion. Not that it was going to do any good. Um, you know, so people were very familiar with this. And then when I, my mother said, oh, you got to stop drinking milk because you're going to get strontium-90 in your teeth from all these nuclear weapons tests and um, things like that. But, you know, now people are unaware of this. You know, they don't have this experience. You know, and there's a lot of politicians and uh uh, you know, you just look at the United States. I mean, there's politicians who are total idiots. You really wonder if they could even uh, tell the truth about anything. Uh, you know, we have one guy who just got um, arrested for multiple lies and embezzlement and fraud. And, and this is an elected congressman. Um, you know, so th these people have no understanding of the world. They know almost nothing about it. Not, you know, there are obviously politicians who are very well informed and know a lot about things, but there's also a lot of people who are just, you know, out of control, you know, and, and there's dangers from dictators, you know, I mean, that's the problem with Putin, he wants to be a czar, he is a czar, I guess, and he wants to be uh, Putin the Great, and reestablish the Soviet Union, and that's just not in con a concept that's consistent with the modern world, where, you know, we thought in 1990, early 1990s, when the Soviet Union disintegrated, that peace had broken out, and people would solve their problems with their negotiations. And, you know, Europe is, you know, booming and after the war and very rich and uh, doing very well, um, which is, you know, all about peace. You know, countries that are at peace, you know, are very rich, and people that are investing in the military are very poor. And, you know, I think Russia is something people have to be very concerned about. You know, so we have nuclear, we have North Korea there, which is a failed country, dictatorship that enriches a small number of people, the population is starving, and instead of investing in their country, 
like South Korea does. They're investing in their military, you know, with throwing all their money away and nothing. Uh, nobody's actually interested in attacking North Korea, um, but the dictatorship maintains itself by the military. And you see the same things happening in Russia. You know, Russia should be a European country. Of course, half of it's in Asia, but stuff should be a European country, you know, like every other European country and making things and keeping its population happy and developing new ideas and helping the world. But instead of doing that, it wants to make money and put their money into their military and build up a big military and involve themselves in Syria and everybody else and show their might around the world. And, you know, that's just not going to work in the long run. And Russia's economy is heavily based on fossil fuels and fossil fuels are not going to be used uh, as the century goes on because of the global warming problem. And Russia is not dealing with that. They're going, they're moving in the direction of a failed state. You know, that's very dangerous for the rest of the world to have a, a failed state develop in a powerful country like Russia with a huge military and a dictatorship. Um, you know, that's a, that's a very bad thing for the world. Um, and hopefully hmm. something will happen to to turn Russia around. Yeah, let's hope. Uh, and uh, there is also China who is, uh, you know, developing more and more nuclear weapons as well. They want to catch up with the rest of the world, which it's a bit surprising because so far they've been more on the, we are happy with 300 or, or so nuclear weapons. So I don't know, it doesn't look yeah. so good neither on this side. Yeah, well, China showed a lot of sense and intelligence to not waste a lot of money on nuclear weapons and instead to develop the wealth of their population, which they have done. I mean, China is an astonishing place to go and visit. You know, everything is new and, you know, there's all these huge new airports and new highways everywhere and all these new opportunities for the people in China and they're doing very well there. You know, it's a very big mistake for them to uh, all of a sudden start becoming belligerent and attacking their neighbors and things like that. And hopefully China will have enough sense to to see that the path they were on a few years ago is makes much more sense than try to wield power all over the earth. And, um, you know, they can also wield economic power without having military power. China's probably smarter that way than... They probably might have a, a long plan for the next, uh, for, for the rest of the century that is hopefully based on economy and trade and if uh, so last question to conclude this conversation if a listener wish to work on this topic or have a positive impact in reducing risk of nuclear conflict what are some of your recommendations yes well that's um an issue that's uh very interesting i did a lot of work on the ozone hole problem for example uh, which was an important threat to the planet um, we're very lucky we stopped putting all those compounds in the atmosphere you know, there are thousands of scientists around the world that worked on that problem, and we solved the problem. Now, although it's going to take another many decades for the ozone hole to really go away, but thousands of people worked on that. Uh, and this nuclear war problem, um, there's probably 20 people working on it. And it's a bigger problem, more complicated problem than the ozone hole problem. So there's uh, plenty of need for many other people to work on it. You know, the militaries of the world might be working on it. Um, there's no evidence that they're thinking about it. There's no evidence that they were evaluating what would happen if there was a war and what kind of destruction they would cause. But, you know, there's plenty of work, smart people in the military. And so they're certainly um, understanding at a high level there. And right this minute, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences has a panel evaluating what would happen in nuclear war, which is an important step forward. Uh, they haven't done this for 40 years, and they used to do it before 1980. They did it frequently, and they haven't done it for 40 years. And so at least we've gotten some uh, recognized scientific body to look at it. But the rest of the world needs to do that. You know, the the British needs to think about this with their um, the people that they trust, and the French and the Russians. Uh, this is what this is what happened in the 1980s. There were 70,000 weapons, and Ronald Reagan and Cal Gorbachev said, oh, this is not right. We need to do something about this. And Reagan said, American scientists have told us that a nuclear winter could happen after a nuclear war. 
Uh, I know about the year without a summer from a volcano. So that I believe this could happen. I think I have to do something. And Mikhail Gorbachev said, Russian scientists had told me that there could be a nuclear winter. And I believe my Russian scientists, this is immoral and people that are people that with morality have to act in this situation and we need to do something. And so Reagan and Gorbachev got together and said, we're going to withdraw weapons from Europe, um, short range uh, rockets and nuclear weapons from Europe and build down the nuclear arsenals, which have been built down by every Russian and American leader since then. So, you know, we get almost 40 years of build down from 70,000 weapons to about 10,000 now. Unfortunately, this has stopped. You know, the Trump administration stopped um, the treaty that Reagan and, and um, Gorbachev put in place. Putin then stopped it. You know, Putin has now walked away from the only other treaty that existed. Both sides are building arsenals back up. You know, so this is madness. And, you know, so when obviously we're not in a position right now where the U.S. and Russia are, are communicating very well, but this Ukraine war won't go on forever when it ends. We have to bring pressure on both countries to go back to the negotiating table and go back to getting rid of these weapons because they're a threat to everybody on the planet. Um, it's just not the right thing to do. Yeah, definitely. Those really scary prospects. Um, yeah. So I guess what kind of job would help? What kind of career? Is it uh, more in the politicians? Uh, or or do, you, do we have, do we still need uh, scientists to study this phenomenon of nuclear winter? What kind of... Um, Yeah. We do need to have scientists study because there's a bunch of things we don't understand, like how much fuel is there in cities, and how do you when, how do you know when a fire is going to put stuff in the stratosphere as opposed to not put it there? How much do we really know about the optical properties of smoke? There's a lot of scientific issues here, and um, there is um, some effort to increase the number of people working there. And the problem is to find funding for the scientists. And right now, all of our funding comes from uh, private foundations, and a new private foundation is starting to fund some other people who work on this problem. So there, there used to be some funding from the military for people to work on it, but there hasn't been for 30 or 40 years. Um, so we, we need to get the military to start talking to the rest of the science community. Um, you know, So there's no reason for them to go sit in their little super secret corners and uh, not talk to anybody else. And, um, You know, uh, that that's not healthy. Um, so there is a need for scientists, but there's also a need for um, social scientists, agricultural scientists. You know, do agricultural people really um, believe the paper we just published about how many people would starve to death in a couple of years? And there's very complicated issues there that we didn't even look into about, you know, stopping transportation. You know, that would damage agriculture by itself and you'd run out of uh, refinery fuels and things like that. And And like New Zealand, for example, to take that as an example, we find that they would almost everybody would survive there. Um, and the reason for that is because right now they grow a lot of sheep for export. They could just stop exporting the sheep and eat sheep. And the sheep would have grass to eat, probably. And um, so in Australia, likewise, has a very high survival rate, not because of sheep, but for other agricultural reasons. And um, so we need to really examine that in the 1980s, people thought that uh, what would happen in New Zealand is that their generators would break down and they wouldn't be able to fix them. And so they'd lose all their power and um, they'd have other problems in society because they wouldn't have transportation coming in uh, to replace things that broke. Uh, and I, and, you know, So there's a lot of things to think about there that social scientists and economists could think about, about how would the world respond to this kind of a thing. And it's not just a nuclear war. We could have a volcano go off at any moment. You know, there would be much more. And historically, there have been volcanoes that have been much more powerful than anything we've seen in the last hundreds of years. You know, and that that could cause a similar destruction of agriculture worldwide. I mean, so people don't understand the agricultural situation we're in, and that is that if there's bad weather somewhere, then somebody else ships food to that place. Like the United States sent food to Russia and the Soviet Union, the Carter administration because they had a bad wheat harvest. You know, so every year somebody has a bad crop and people make up for it by shipping food around. The nuclear war, you're not going to ship food around anymore. 
Uh, and even in, in moderate cat cat catastrophe on the planet, food shopping shipping will stop. And in the average city, there's enough food to feed people for about a week. After a week, there's no food unless you ship it in. No gasoline, nothing going to get shipped in. And people who've read the Bible or the Quran will know this story of Joseph and the Pharaoh, in which uh, e Egypt in the time of Joseph and the Pharaohs stored food up for six years so they could feed the Egyptians for six years. Maybe it was seven years. And this is all based on some dream the Pharaoh was having about fat cows and skinny cows. Um, at any rate, the Pharaoh in this story uh, becomes a hero to the Egyptians, which, of course, took 14 years or something like that, which Americans don't operate on that kind of time scale anyway. But actually, there isn't six years of food in storage. There's two months of food in storage. So the average amount of food in storage is two to three months. It fluctuates how good the weather was in a year. So if something happens and it gets rid of a crop and people can't make it up because everybody on the planet was damaged, people will start starving within about two months because we're running out of food. You know, people are not aware of this. You know, they, they think, oh, there's always food in the grocery store. You know, it magically appears. <laughs> it doesn't magically appear. You know, somebody raised those chickens and somebody grew that wheat. And they grew it right recently uh, and sent it to you on, on a ship or a plane or something. And so uh, we're, the world is in danger from this, and not just from the nuclear war. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I will share all the information in the description for those who want to know more. And uh, yeah, thank you very much again for, for uh, this fascinating conversation. Great. It was nice to talk to you. I enjoyed thank the you. conversation.